um, because the series I've been speaking about uh, recently is looking at God's ways and understanding His ways and walking in them, conforming our lives to His ways. Um, so, you know, He calls all of us to walk in His ways. You know, there are no special people in God's sight. We are all special and we all have a, a particular place in His sight. And He deals with us individually, you know, so carefully and so individually. You know, He, he doesn't treat us like just a person in the crowd. Um, but at the same time, you know, he, 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 has, he is not partial to any of us. He doesn't have special favorites whom He treats with, you know, uh, more blessing and, and more favor than, than others. Uh, he has, uh, uh, you know, blessings for each one of us individually. And He has made us as individuals and He has made us in such a way that we're all different from one another. And therefore, He has a particular word for each one of us in different areas. And um, I want you to be challenged this morning to seek out His ways and see where is it that I need to change, even if it's my way of thinking or my way of, of walking, my way of behavior uh, towards others or, or, or in the workplace or in any circumstance. Uh, and let us seek to be conformed uh, to His ways. And I want to remind you what Isaiah says in chapter 55. God is speaking to, to the people Israel uh, through Isaiah, and He says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And he goes on to say in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I want to talk today about uh, uh, a, a particular subject in God's ways. And I call it greatness through serving. And this is one of those areas where I think it's such a drastic difference and so clear uh, that we can see that God's ways are uh, so, so much higher than our ways. And His thoughts are so different to our thoughts and our way of thinking. Greatness through serving. Um, you know, in the world, uh, and as human beings, we, we have a way of thinking about greatness. And when you consider who is great in the world, um, a few things come to mind. Who, who is great? Can I ask you, who's the greatest person in this world uh, as, as far as, as you estimate them to be? Who's the greatest person on earth to you? Um, and your, your um, set of values influences that, right? And, and the way you appraise things and uh, value things and, and um, the way you see things, uh, that forms how you think of this subject of greatness. Who is great? And what makes them great? And when I think of you know, what makes a person great in this world, there's a few things I think about, uh, naturally speaking. Wealth is probably the number one. When someone is great in this world, you know, and and from what I can see as people esteeming somebody to be, to be great, what's the number one characteristic? Uh, usually, I think it's wealth. When someone is rich, wealthy, uh, lives a lavish lifestyle, that person becomes great in the eyes of others. Uh, and in my fleshly mind, I too think, you know, wow, I look up to the, the wealthy because they have it all, so to speak. And I want to be like them. I want to be great like them. Uh, the, the second thing is popularity. You know, naturally one follows the other. When someone is wealthy, they become popular also. They get lots of friends. Is that right? Um, and what we see, you know, we have Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and so many things which uh, are all about popularity, followers. Um, and we see that the, the greatest, the, you know, the, 
the people who I guess we can esteem as being great are those who have many followers. Why would they have followers if they were not a great person, an important person? People flock to the important people. Just like movie stars, film stars, you know, when if, if somebody really famous came along here, well, you'd have a crowd outside, you know, cheering and, and wanting to meet them and shake their hand. You know, let's think, you know, um, if a great movie star came, came here, they wouldn't be coming alone. They would have a crowd following them. Why? Because people esteem such people uh, to be great. And when we think of greatness, we think also, also of intellectual people, people who are intelligent and have done great things in life because, you know, they are intelligent, you know, and it's no coincidence that, uh, you know, we, we, we know Albert Einstein, for example. Why do we know of him? Because he was an intelligent man and he made great discoveries, uh, things of importance. Um, but what made Ab Albert Einstein so, uh, so great? His intelligence. We, you know, thinking in human terms. His intelligence made him great. What else? A job title or a profession can make one great. Don't we esteem for uh, certain uh, professions over others? Why do we uh, seek to be, you know, for example, engineers? or someone in business, someone who is, you know, a, a CEO, uh, who's got an MBA and, and who knows how to run a business. Uh, well, you know, that's, that's something that we esteem as great. And therefore, we seek out those things that would make us great. What do we seek for? Position. We seek for a profession. But things are quite different in the kingdom of God. And these things have really no importance in God's eyes. Um, and greatness in God's kingdom is very different. It's altogether different. And God esteems things so much differently than we do as, you know, as human beings with our, you know, just our, our natural mind. We appraise things differently. Um, and what is greatness in the kingdom of heaven? I want to read to you Matthew chapter 18 and verses 1 to 4. It tells us there that at that time the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him a question. And their question was an important one. And they said to him, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's a good question. And we should ask that question also for ourselves, uh, because it's, a, it's an important answer as well. And he called a child, Jesus called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Wow. What an answer. Would that really rank as, as important to us when we consider greatness? You know, if I want to be somebody great in this world, would I even think of, of what Jesus said? Not at all. Whoever humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of earth or the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven are so different. And God's thinking is so different from our thinking. His ways are so different from our ways. In Luke chapter 9, we see a similar situation. Luke chapter 9 from verse 46, it says that an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. This is talking about the disciples again. So the disciples were arguing amongst themselves who is the greatest. These are disciples. These are followers of Jesus who are supposed to be, you know, a disciple follows somebody and learns from them in order that they might become like their master. 
Yet here they are arguing with one another as to who's the greatest. So they want to know what's the rank. You know, we know Jesus is, is you know, he's the leader. But amongst ourselves, who's, who's, who's the greatest? Who's, you know, got first rank, second rank, third rank? Uh, just imagine what they might have been uh, saying and how they might have been arguing. Um, but Jesus, knowing that they were think- what they were thinking in their hearts, it says that he took a child and stood him by his side. And he said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. Uh, You know, that's the same answer as before that we saw in Matthew. The one who is least among you, this is the one who is great. The one who is the most humble is the greatest. The one who is smallest, the one who is least, the one who is the most nobody, the most insignificant, he is the greatest. Does that make any sense to you and I? Does it make sense? Again, in Luke chapter 22, this is another situation, a similar situation. So that was Luke chapter 9. Now we look at Luke chapter 22 from verse 24. Again, the same thing happens. And there arose also a dispute among them, among the disciples, uh, as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. I'm among you as one who serves. The same answer all over again, the same situation, the disciples arguing over who's the greatest. Do we argue ever over who's the greatest? Maybe indirectly, maybe implicitly, when we have arguments in the home, you know, and there's arguments between siblings. Have you ever had an argument with your sibling at home over who's better, who's greater, who's more important, who's the boss? What about between husband and wife? Is there tension? Is there friction over who's the, who's, who's the boss? We have the same problems. We're just like the disciples. How many times have we had such, such arguments or, or such frictions at home? Is there an argument at work? You know? Maybe you might not say in such terms, hey, I'm, I'm the greatest here. My position is higher than yours. I've got a greater salary than yours. But do we, do we quarrel over things? Uh, and in the back of my, our minds, we have this idea that, hey, I'm, I'm greater. You need to uh, be my subordinate. You need to listen to me. You need to do things the way I do them. You know, I'm more important because I have a better degree. Or something like that. Is there competition in the workplace? Well, the answer for us would be the same. Just as Jesus said to the disciples. Yes, in the world it is that way. Let it be that way in the world. But let that not be the case for you. With you, it's got to be different. He's talking to his disciples. Everything has to be different. And if you want to be great you've got to be the least. If you want to be a leader, you've got to be a servant. That's how things work in the kingdom of God. Things are altogether different. It's upside down. In John chapter 13, you know, just, we we just read, Jesus said, you know, the, the person who is greatest is the one who sits at the table. When you have a banquet or when you have a, a dinner, 
the one who sits at the table is the honored guest, is the most important person, right? And the least person is the one who serves, right? A waiter, a, a waitress, someone who uh, comes and serves food uh, on the table. That's how we have this idea of greatness. The one who reclines at the table is supposed to be the, the more important person, right? But Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. And we know that the disciples called him a master and called him teacher and called him Lord. But Jesus says of himself, I am the one who serves among you. And in John chapter 13, we see an example where he really was the servant. And from verse 12, where he washed the disciples' feet. We know the story. And, you know, they go to have the supper and everything was prepared in the upper room and they all go there. But what needed to happen was, you know, when you come from outside and your feet are dirty because you've worn sandals all day and this was the, at the end of the day and you can't sit down to eat without first washing your feet. But where was the servant? The servant wasn't there. And so imagine the disciples all sort of standing around waiting. Who's going to wash our feet before we get started? They knew that, you know, the, the feet needed to be washed. And who was going to wash the feet? And none of the disciples took the initiative. No one put up their hand and said, Hey, look, a dirty job's got to get done. I'm going to do it this time. None of them did it. You know who did it? Jesus did it. Why? Because he was used to being a servant. And he lived out this principle of being a servant. He says, I am among you as one who serves. And so when the feet needed to be washed, he got a towel and he washed them, every one of them. And then he says to them, I have given you an example. Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you're right for so I am. If then I, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I did to you. Jesus lived by example. And he gave them an example that they would do also in the same way. To wash one another's feet, to do the dirty jobs, to be a servant, um, when there was something that needed to be done, not to stand around waiting for someone to volunteer, but to be the one who uh, volunteers and, and does the work. Uh, we see the same sort of uh, scenarios as we read earlier, mentioned also in Mark. And chapter 9 and verse 33 to 35. When they got to Capernaum and, and they went into a house and Jesus asked the disciples a question, what were you discussing on the way? But they all kept silent for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So this makes it a little more clearer for us. The way Jesus uh, says it, he who wants to be first shall be last and the servant of all. Do you want to be first? Where do you want to be first? Do you want to be first in your home? Well, you've got to be last. You've got to be servant of all. And to some degree, you know, the parents uh, exemplify this anyway. You look at your children, you know, they have many needs and uh, you know, I, my wife and I sometimes joke about it and we say, we're just servants in our own home. We're here to do the, their bidding. You know, whenever they want milk, we've got to get up at any hour of the night and we've got to make milk for them. You know, if they, if they cry, we are the ones who rush to them and we help them, we comfort them. Um, we make food, food for them. We clean them up. We clean the house. We clean the toys after they've made a mess. Um, and so it is that way uh, to some extent um, that, you know, we, we see a bit of a paradox in, in even in, in this. And we know, you know, as the Word of God says, 
the, the husband is the head of the home. Well, the head of the home is sometimes, you know, the, the, the greatest servant in the home. And that's the way that it should be. Uh, but those who are of higher rank, they are the, the least. They are the lowest. But let us take on that attitude all the time. And let us move with that attitude in other areas in life. Why don't we do that in our workplace, for example? Uh, have you ever seen the CEO in your company uh, do some meaningless chore you know, at work in, uh, to, serve, to serve others? We don't really carry that mentality elsewhere. Um, but that's, that's the way things should be for us as Christians. You know, our mind has to be changed and renewed and conformed to God's way of thinking. Where if I want to be first, even in my workplace, then what Jesus is saying, I've got to be the one who works the hardest. And even if I've got to serve others and help others to bless them, to help them with their work, then that's how you ought to be the greatest. That's how you ought to fight this this fight of trying to be the greatest in your workplace. Not by arguments and by degrees and by uh, diplomas and, and whatever else, or by the, the size of your salary. No, you've got to be the hardest worker. That's how you get to be first. Can we carry that attitude through in our workplace? So he who wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And again in Mark 10, just reiterated for us again, Jesus says in, from verse uh, 41, um, actually this is the situation where James and John spoke to Jesus and they asked him, uh, we want you to do something for us. We want you to reserve a place at your left side and at your right size, side for us, for James and John. Um, and, you know, when the other disciples heard this, they got upset. They got offended because they wanted to be first. They wanted to sit next to Jesus in his kingdom. They wanted first place. And so the others got upset with them, but Jesus, he knew this. He knew they got upset and he says, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And the great men exercise authority over them. But it's not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. And I just want to point out from, from this passage, the fact that Jesus says, you know, with the Gentiles out there in the world, um, those who are in authority, what do they do? They exercise their authority. They assert their authority over others. And that's how it is, really, in this world. You want, uh, uh, you know, everyone wants to assert their authority in one way or another and to show people, hey, I'm the boss here. I'm important here. Um, and threatening and, and things like that are used in order to prove this point. Hey, I'm the greatest. I'm in control. I have control over you. Uh, but that's not how it should be uh, for us as a church. That's not how it should be in our homes even. Uh, when Jesus says that the, the husband is the head of the home, for example, uh, I'm not allowed to take that role on, as it were, and take that title and say, hey, I'm the boss here. Jesus has just given me permission to be the boss and to exert my authority and to enforce my position onto others. No, that's not how it should be. It's like that in the world. Whoever is in authority wants to exert their authority, wants to assert their authority um, and bring everyone else under their authority. But as we've already seen, Jesus says, you want to be first, you want to be someone in authority. A position of authority is not one of greatness. 
Authority does not give you greatness. Authority, you know what authority gives you? Responsibility. And responsibility is this, that you serve. And in fear and trembling, use the authority that God has given you. That's how it should be in our homes. That's how it should be in the church. If you want to be a leader, what do you have to be in practical terms? How should people see that you're a leader? You're a servant by being a servant. And a servant of who and how many? A servant of all. If you get the greatest authority, you get the greatest responsibility. So don't go looking for position. Use it, uh, you know, and, and if you do have a position of authority, whether it's in your home, in your workplace, uh, use it with fear and trembling, knowing that you answer to somebody. You are not the, the, the final authority. There is somebody above whom you have to give an account to. And, yeah, it's a serious thing to be in a position of authority, to be in a position of leadership. And, you know, uh, it's better to be a, a follower than a leader. But, yes, he gives us the privilege of, of being leaders, of having authority over others, but we are to use it in serving others. Because at the end, when we stand before the Lord, we will all have to give an account for how we've used, how we have administered, how, how good have we been at being stewards of what he has entrusted to us. You know, in uh, Matthew 23, Jesus, we know that he had problems with the Pharisees and the scribes, those whom God had given authority in this nation of Israel. He had given authority to the scribes the scribes were those who knew the scriptures and knew the law of God. And they had the greater responsibility also of teaching those principles of God and the laws of God to everyone else. And the Pharisees who were very well educated in the law of God, in the word, words of God, in God's expectations, um, they were the leaders, they were real, well respected in Israel. And everybody looked up to them and, and honored them and respected them. Uh, but Jesus had a problem with them because they misused their, uh, their responsibility, their authority, their position that God had entrusted to them. And he says this about them in Matthew 23 from verse 6. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. This was Jesus' uh, problem with them. They were given a responsibility. They were entrusted with the words of God, uh, God's principles and, and God's commandments to teach others, hey, this is how the Lord wants us to walk. This is how he wants us to live. And so they were to teach others to keep God's commandments. And when they would do that, it would be well with them. And so they would tell people, hey, here are the promises of God for you and the blessings of God for you, but walk in this way and you shall benefit of God's blessing in your life. But how did they use their position? They used it instead of serving the people and helping the people, they used it in this way to gain something out of the people. And it even says to them, uh, Jesus even says to them, you place heavy burdens upon people's shoulders and you don't even help them. You don't help them to, to lift that burden with even so much as a finger. And so he had a problem with them because they loved respectful greetings in the marketplaces. 
They love being called rabbi by men and all sorts of titles and receiving honor from men. And they saw it as a position to be grasped, as something to be grasped, something to be gained out of their position, to gain honor from people, to gain praise, uh, to gain respect, and to dress nicely and appear, uh, you know, uh, nice before others. But Jesus said this, don't use titles. And he said, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. This is God's way of thinking. You are in a position of authority or in a position of responsibility. Don't use it for your own benefit. Use it to benefit others. Use it to serve others. This is the whole mindset of the kingdom of God. If God gives you something, He expects you to use it for the benefit of others, for the blessing of others. Whether it's material blessing, whether it's intellectual ability, whether it's uh, other you know, physical abilities and skills that He has given you, use it to bless others. Don't use it to gain glory for yourself and to become conceited and think that you are someone greater than others. Everything that is good comes from the Lord. And one day we will have to give an account for how we have used the things that He has given us. And we have Jesus as an example. And we see so clearly in Philippians chapter 2, from verse 5, it tells us to have the same attitude as Jesus had. What was His attitude when He came to earth? It says, have this same attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And in verse 9, it goes on to say, for this reason, for what reason? Because he emptied himself and took the form of a bondservant, he humbled himself, he lowered himself. It says, For this reason God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Why was our Lord exalted? Because he also humbled himself. And he was exalted and given a name above every other name. Why? Because first of all, he humbled himself lower than any other man. Yes, he humbled himself when he came from heaven to earth. But even on earth, being found uh, in the likeness of men, took on a body like men, he lowered himself even more. He humbled himself even further. Not to become a lord over men. Even that would have been, you know, enough. God, the one whom, through whom all things have been created, to step down to earth and walk among his creation, it would have been enough for him to come down as Lord and to rule and to reign on earth and be a king. But that wasn't enough for him. He humbled himself even more. And what did he become? Instead of becoming a Lord over people, he became a servant of people. He humbled himself the lowest. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest position. Do you, do you think God has favorites? Do you think God is partial? Is He going to exalt some and not others? What does He do that? What he, does He base that on? If you humble yourself, He will exalt you. That's a promise in the Word. As we already read, whoever humbles himself will be exalted and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. That's a, a permanent law of God. And, you know, just like the law of gravity. Gravity always pulls you down. Um, there is this law that God will, will humble those who exalt themselves. And so let us be wise and humble ourselves and let God do the exalting. We see then, you know, as it says that Jesus humbled himself and he took a form of of a bond servant. What does a bond servant mean? Uh, 
Brother Sam already mentioned this last week and encouraged us to come to this place of being a bond servant. And a bond servant is one who is a servant willingly, who gives himself over to be a servant willingly, not by force, but willingly. It's not imposed or forced upon you, but it's something that you can only take on willingly. Otherwise, you are not a bond servant. And we see then this word mentioned a lot in the New Testament. And who is it used by? The disciples of Jesus. Those who followed him for those three and a half years and learned from him. And those same disciples who are arguing about who is the greatest now had become those who knew how to humble themselves and they gave themselves this title, bondservant of Jesus Christ. We see that repeated over and over in the letters in the New Testament. Peter, John, Paul, James and Jude, all of them use this title of bondservants. And so, you know, just to give you an example, Paul, when he writes to the Romans, he begins his letter this way. He says, Paul a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. What's the, you know, if you were to ask Paul, who are you? The first thing he said is, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, I am an apostle who has been called as an apostle to serve the Lord and to take the gospel out. And so that was the first thing he said. Who am I? I am a bond servant. And then secondly, I'll tell you what God has given me to do, what, what job God has given me to do. And so bond ser a bond servant always is given a task to do, a work to do. And so this position, this, or this title, if we can call it that, of a, an apostle is nothing but a service that God entrusts uh, to certain people. And we see that is valid for any position that you might have in the church. It says in, in Ephesians that he gives some as apostles, some as teachers, some as evangelists, and so many various gifts and functions in the body. What are they all for? For the equipping of the saints for service. Uh, they are not titles that we are to take and to, you know, puff ourselves up and think, you know, Hey, I'm a teacher. I'm an apostle. I'm somebody. You need to respect me. No, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to serve with it. It is a service. And so that's why, you know, uh, greatness, I say greatness through service. This is one of God's principles and one of God's ways. You think you are somebody. You, on, you are only as great as, as is your service. The greater your service is, the greater you are as a, as, a, as a person, if you consider yourself as being somebody. And we see the primary characteristics of a bond servant. I just want to point out a couple of verses. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, it says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And in Romans 12 verse 10, it says, give preference to one another in honor. So what is a bond servant? One who serves. And one who considers themselves as less important than others. He considers uh, as he considers others as more important than self. And so, what a challenge it is for us. What a challenge to regard one another as more important than ourselves. It's not something that comes naturally, is it? We, we serve our own ambitions and our own plans and our own desires so many times. And we look after our own personal interests. But Lord, help us to change that. At least even from this day, to be changed more and more into the likeness of Jesus. To be a bondservant who considers others as more important. 
the needs of others and the interests of others, you know, to seek out for those interests, not just my own. And we see in the church that the Holy Spirit, God has given the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has various gifts and talents and abilities that he gives to each one. And, you know, the church is not a place of uh, where you come to receive primarily. It's, the church is primarily a place where you come to give. And I've said this before, but if we all come here with this mindset of receiving and not giving, if we all come with that same mindset, who is going to receive anything? Nobody. Because everyone comes to receive, no one comes to give. So if there's no giving, there's no receiving. But if we all come with a mindset to give, who is going to receive anything? Everyone will receive everything because everyone wants to give, therefore everyone will also receive. And so that is what the church is supposed to be, primarily a place where we all come to give. And God does not leave any one of us without a particular gift, something that we can serve with in the church, something that we can do to bless others, to serve others, uh, something to give. You know, it's, it's a matter of how diligent we are with, with that. Um, and God gives gifts to each one that we see in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It tells us that there are various gifts, but the same Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives to each one a manifestation um, for the common good. So we all receive gifts. Each one has to receive something to serve with in the church. And the gifts are given for the common good. The gifts are not so that I can be exalted. My gift is not so I can exalt myself and be somebody important. My gift is given to me to bless others, to serve others with. And each one of us are given something. And so if you're not serving, find a way to serve. Ask the Lord. And if he gives you an opportunity, be diligent, be faithful to serve with what little he gives you. And you know what Jesus says to faithful servants? Good and faithful servant, well done. You've been faithful in little, I'll give you more. And so it's never a case of, oh, God has not given me anything. Yes, he has. You just haven't been doing anything with it. And if you think and you look at others and you see, oh, wow, some, such and such has such a great gift and, you know, is, is a man of God doing such great works for the Lord out there. No, that's not how we should be uh, looking at things. You know, if they have been faithful in little and God has enlarged uh, their, you know, their gift to use it for the greater good of others, um, then that's good. But you can, you know, you need to also be faithful as well in little. Don't envy anyone else's ministry. Don't envy anyone else's gift. Uh, be faithful in the little that you can uh, do and God will give you more to be faithful with. But if you are unfaithful even with little, why would God give you more? You know, if I give to my son a dollar, a single coin, and he doesn't take care of it, why should I give him two dollars? Why should I give him a five dollar note? He's not going to take care of it. But if I see that he takes care of even one dollar, and he knows the value of it, and he uses it wisely, then I can entrust more to him, right? It's the same way with us. Things are simple, you know. They don't need to be complicated for us. And so use what little you have, and God will give you more. God wants us to be uh, useful. He wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to serve and be a blessing and, you know, not, not just because God wants us to have a difficult time and he's mean to us and he wants us all to just slave away and, and you know, just uh, do hard work and he wants to see us sweat and labor. Things are different in his kingdom. It's not like on earth. 
where you are unappreciated many times for your hard work. Yes, man doesn't appreciate, but God appreciates everything. And he says, even a glass of cold water that you give in my name shall be rewarded. God is not careless. He is, he is, you know, he's not blind to everything that we do. Any service that we do for him with a sincere heart, he is going to reward it and he's going to bless it. And we will be blessed. And we have this proverb. Proverbs 11 verse 25 where it says, The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. If you are generous, you'll be prosperous. But, it, but if you are stingy, maybe you won't be prosperous. And he who waters others will himself be watered. You know, I see this principle in, on earth, you know, in, in this world, that, you know, the wealthier we tend to become, the more uh, stingy we tend to become also, the more tight-fisted. The more money you have, the more you hold on to it, the less generous you become. How foolish it is, you know, how foolish. But also, you know, we, we are so unwilling to serve others and to help others because we think, you know, if I give what I have to others, I'm going to miss out. But it's not like that in God's kingdom. It's not like that in His way of um, valuing things. It's not uh, His way of, of doing things. He rewards those who um, serve, those who bless others will themselves be watered. He will not let you go without. And so we have this wonderful pr principle in the, in the kingdom of God that if you serve others, if you are faithful in serving others, you yourself will be blessed, more blessed. And Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you believe that? Try it out. Yes, you may not receive material blessings in return. That's all right. That doesn't matter. God gives the eternal riches. Spiritually, you will prosper. Spiritually, you will be more blessed. When you serve others, you yourself will be more blessed. And in, we see, you know, in a, the example of Israel, where God had called priests and Levites to serve in the temple. And I want to just point out one thing. Um, God had called, you know, Aaron and his descendants to come and serve in the temple. And you know what he said to Aaron? You are not going to have any portion, any land um, in the land of Israel. Um, you'll just be set apart for me to serve me in the temple and to serve the people. Do you, do you think that they were, you know, wretched people? the priests and the Levites who had no, you know, no land to go to and uh, they couldn't own land, but they, they did uh, live in homes and, um, you know, they couldn't, couldn't have their own jobs and go and earn a living. Do you think that they were miserable for it? No. God had blessed them abundantly. And I'm not just talking about material things. But look at what God says to them. In, in Numbers chapter 18, verse 20, the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in the land, nor own any portion among them. But now look at what God says. I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. God said, I am your portion and I am your inheritance. I wonder whether we can see with spiritual eyes. Yes, if we serve others, we may, uh, you know, miss out on something. Yes, we give physical things, material things, our time, our energy to others. What are we going to get in return? I see here that God is closer to those who serve. He is closer and He is their portion. You will not miss out you will have God closer to you. And so think of it this way. 
Who was closest to God in all of Israel? Who was closest? Who was nearest to the Lord in all of Israel? The priests and the Levites, those, Levites, those who were close to the temple, those who were serving there day and night, they were closer to God than anyone else. So where do you want to be? You want to be far away from the Lord or do you want to be close to Him? How do you get close to Him? Well, He calls us all to be a priesthood. He calls us all to be servants. You want to get close to God? Serve diligently and faithfully and God will be near to you. You'll be the closest to the Lord. And I can testify that any time that I've served others, I have been refreshed. God is not, you know, He, he doesn't, he, He's never remains indebted to anyone. You think you're going to bless others and give to others and you're going to experience a lack? No. You'll get maybe even greater blessings than others do who get material blessings. So, I just want to stir you and encourage you and leave you with this verse. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Let us see with new eyes, with spiritual eyes, to see things the, the way God sees things, to walk in Jesus' footsteps, to have his attitude, to serve rather than to be served. If Jesus could say, I'm among you as one who serves, not as one who has come to be served. Can we all have that same attitude? You know, I can imagine, you know, when it comes to being somebody in this world, everyone crowds to that place and there is a big lineup, so to speak, a big queue of people wanting to be great in this world. Just imagine if there was such a place where you go to that place to be a somebody. What a long queue there would be out in the streets for kilometers. People would line up to be somebody great, wouldn't they? What about this? When you hear something like this, I wonder how many people crowd. Is there a long queue at such a place like this where Jesus says, uh, if you want to be great, be a servant? Are people, you know, elbowing each other and trying to push in, in in the line to get closer to the goal of being somebody great? Can you see that? Can we change our mindset from now on and see that things are different and perhaps think a little more like God does? Let us be such people who are closer to the Lord and who are following in His footsteps.